sir we are now live on the youtube i'll just share our today's program for a few seconds okay Yes, sir. We are ready to go. Okay. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you. I am Dr. Arumugam, President of Indian Association of Sports Medicine. I take a pleasure with my great privilege to invite you all for the series of uh, webinars on sports science, and uh, I. Uh, take this opportunity to thank Malaysian Association of Sports Medicine and the Asian Federation of Sports Medicine uh, for supporting this uh, education uh, initiative, and also thank uh, for our uh, speakers for today. Today we are going to have a hot topic of sports science, biomechanic. Now, that's a uh, uh, very intrigue, and that is the most debated uh, topic. And we have the stalwarts uh, in this field. From all over the world, Dr. Uh, Ramya Bhatt from uh, Lebanon, Dr. Mark Porters from Australia, Dr. Jonathan Williams from United Kingdom, and our own Dr. Rajan. I'm sure it will be a uh, uh, very interesting and it will be a didactic lecture, so that uh, delegates are uh, welcome to uh, add some questions. Your questions will go to chat box. Moderator will then. Forward your questions to the speakers. Again, I take this opportunity to thank our uh, speakers for taking time of the busy schedule and the difficult time of uh, pandemic among their administrative work uh, to find time to share their knowledge with us. And without taking much of time, I request Dr. Tyagarajan to take over and uh, continue the proceedings. Thank you, sir. And uh, with this, uh, we start the session today with our first speaker, Professor Ramya Bhut, who is a very well-known figure in the international uh, scene of uh, biomechanics and uh, especially on his work with foot and ankle. And he is a leading researcher and uh, the author of uh, so many articles. And uh, he, he is, uh, the, in fact, the chief editor of the journal, The Foot. And right now, he works in Balaman, uh, Lebanon, for the Balaman University. Previously, was in Dundee University, and uh, we would like to uh, welcome him on board and uh, give his talk, Professor Rami. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind invitation and for asking me to speak on your uh, webinar. I had the privilege to visit your facilities in 2016 for the uh, Indian Association for Sports Medicine in 2016. And this is my fourth contribution to your distinguished conference that has been set in on, on many occasions in many cities. We're talking about COVID and the topic is really overwhelming. And we're talking about pre-COVID and what happened since then. Actually, many things happened. And you rightly said, I was in Dundee. I gained all my expertise uh, in biomechanics during my time in Dundee for the last 31 years before, I have changed allegiance and moved to Lebanon to the University of Balamand in my uh, country of birth. Um, a lot of changes. I believed I could share my experience in a country where biomechanics is still at its own infancy, um, something I can give back to my own society and what happened? A lot of things happened in that year. I arrived in July 2019, and then suddenly we had a civic unrest in Lebanon within two months, and everything went to a standstill. Coming to January, February 2020, the pandemic hit, and we are all suffering from it worldwide. So not only that I have changed directions, um, we have to really think differently. What attracted me to, to Balamand University, it's its own structure. It's a lovely university. It's a campus that is overseeing the Mediterranean and it has the potential. In Dundee, I had few engineers working with me 
and the attraction to work in a faculty of engineering com in comparison to my previous job in the School of Medicine was very attractive. If I have managed to achieve what I have achieved with one or two engineers, what can I do with the whole faculty, especially that I have already a building ready to develop into a new motion facility next to a track and next to a, a, a very strategic views in order to develop this university into a leading university. We've arrived within a year, we've built up a new track for sports and the university jumped within less than a year to achieve a very commendable position when it came with the QS world ranking and became classified as number two in Lebanon despite of its young age of 32 years. Not only that, subsequently it was qualified as the first youngest university in Lebanon and amongst the 70 worldwide. So the vision is there and we need to achieve everything. However, with the pandemic, with the socioeconomic situation, everything has gone on a standstill because we have uh, economic disaster taking place in Lebanon. That should not though stop us from thinking of how we can share our expertise. So the, th the second thing that happened is that now we're conducting these conferences through webinars. So we're sharing our expertise online. It has advantages, it has disadvantages. For me, the main disadvantage is not the ability to be with you in India, something I've always enjoyed to do, traveling once or twice to be with you. And how can I forget the last meeting I was at when the president himself of the Indian Association of Sports Medicine ended up on the stage dancing, concluding as a model in Parag Sancheti. This is something you cannot mimic online and it can only be done live. Enough of that, let's go to biomechanics. Biomechanics of the foot and ankle will not change before COVID or after COVID. You have a distinguished set of speakers later on that are gonna be talking about uh, specificities, specificities about biomechanics according to their own uh, abilities and experience from performance. But the most important thing, and I'm sure that Dr. Portis will be talking about it, is injury prevention. When you understand biomechanics and its role, this is where you can put it to good use in order to avoid injury. We'll go to basics. And from my experience, I learned very, very early in my career from one specific case that I tend to use regularly in any conference I'm invited to because it summarizes everything someone needs to know to make you think outside the box about foot and ankle biomechanics and how powerful biomechanics it is in dealing with patients or athletes. It's the same. You need to learn the basics. So let's start with this case. I hope you can see the video clearly. This is someone with a disability. If you focus on the right foot in here, you can see that this patient is walking on the outside of her foot. She's walking on the dorsum of her foot. This is a disability that she suffered from very early in her life at the age of seven and stayed with her all along and out of desperation, she was asking for an amputation. Once an amputation occurs, you cannot undo it. It is now moving into the auspices of prosthesis, which is another ball game altogether when it comes to biomechanics. So her history in itself, she had repetitive right ankle injuries, inversion, and she was treated by the whole plethora of clinicians from surgeon, neurologists, even psychiatrists. She had many surgeries to try to stabilize her foot to bring it to a plantigrade position, but none worked. All ended up with failures. And the question that one will have to ask, were these surgeries the correct surgeries that they were implemented or was there something missing? If she had, had ended up under the knife of the surgeon and she's gone through the amputation, 
That's what would she have ended up with, a stump that will be fitted with a prosthesis. And then she will have to adapt to a new psychological kind of life, knowing that there is a part of her body missing, an important part, albeit the foot. She was referred to my clinic, and I, at that time I was very young, still doing my PhD, and luckily, my PhD focused on muscle activity and stimulation, looking at the diabetic foot. And when the surgeon referred her to my clinic, I said, what on earth can we do? You're talking about a fixed inverted foot. Nothing can be done. No physiotherapy will work. No orthotics will work. No customized orthopedic footwear will work. You know, you're talking about the impossible. And his answer to me was, if I amputate, I cannot unamputate. What are you going to lose? Give it a try. We did. And the only thing that came to mind was to actually stimulate her muscles. Stimulated the muscles to the extent that I have put 100 volts, nothing happened. 200 volts, nothing happened. 300 volts, nothing happened. And trust me, it was a very low current. Otherwise, she would have died. Last chance. 400 volt, and then the foot everted to normal. So the fixed foot that you were seeing earlier on, we now have a normal foot that is mobile, almost normal range of movement to the extent to say, okay, what is going on here? A little bit of tightness at the toes, but these things can be dealt with accordingly. So the problem here is not a fixed inverted right foot. It's not a disability as per se. There is something hidden that wasn't uncovered in all those 13 years. As soon as the anesthetic worn out, because we put her under anesthetic and it showed us it's a normal foot, the disability returned. She reverted to back to her normal abnormal gait that is more amplified when she puts her shoes on. And you can see it quite clearly that she's walking on the dorsum of the foot. Now, what controls our feet when we're walking? Of course, muscles, lower limb muscles, calf, anterior and posterior muscles, and each one has its own role. So there is a strong muscle imbalance between the posterior tibialis muscle and the perineus muscle. When you have an inverted muscle, the perineus longus is trying to evert the foot. If the posterior tibialis is stronger, it will pull it in and it will simulate a fixed foot. And this is where the treatment was all along wrong. There was an imbalance in muscle strength that was amplified to actually simulate a fixed inverted foot. So the actual foot is virtually stiff, but not really stiff. And we have a normal ankle joint of movement. Why was she referred for psychiatric treatment? Who knows? What happened to the surgeries? Who knows? So the plan of work was mainly now focused on saving that limb and strengthening the lower limb. It's all pure biomechanics. If you strengthen a muscle, to get, regain its functionality, to evert the foot, and you support it with an orthosis, to maintain the plantigrade position that you're doing during stimulation and strengthening the muscles. And it has to be day and night, because you do not want to lose the good work you're building on overnight when you take the cast off. So the patient had to endure a cast that she's wearing day and night, and the cast had to be wedged on the time in order to match the plantigrade position that is being achieved by the physiotherapist as well as by the muscle stimulation. A very relative small surgery in, in the surgeon's book required, and that was related to give us a little bit more movement around the ankle to give us more dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. And in the real world of surgery, this is a minor surgery to lengthen the Achilles tendon to give us more movement around the ankle joint. 
Once that was completed and done, and the patient recovered from the surgery, the only thing was remaining was to re-educate her after a long period of 13 years on how to walk normally. And that's it. Re-education, understanding what happened in the foot biomechanically from tendons to structure to muscle functions will allow anybody thinking outside the box to save, in my book, one of the most important musculoskeletal structures that is in contact with an external surface, which is the only part of the body, the foot, the functionality and the feasibility of maintaining the biomechanics, which will sustain someone's life and allow the patient or an athlete to carry on with their life as normal as possible. So this is the basics of foot and ankle biomechanics. And that's what needs to be understand and absorbed. Understand the structure, the role of the muscles, what happens in every activity before you can even think about treating athletes. So if we move to the area of sports and we look at our runners, every step of the way is important. From the first minute when they set off, the alignment of the joint is so crucial because it plays an important role to the microseconds that they are needed in order to win a competition. Because most of the time among the top athletes, you're talking about almost 0.04 seconds. And that's what will differentiate a top, top athlete that has been trained on how to start and how to run with the ergonomics of running in order to win a race and succeed in his or her mission. The movement is important, the joint ability, the posture, the ergonomics, but there is an important element that we'll go back to it is the foot and ankle. The foot is the only part in contact with an external surface and its position and the way we run is critical. And this is where gait analysis and motion analysis can play an important role in our understandings. And this is where I'm gonna now try to take you to another software, which is purely on gait analysis that will allow us to see some of these activities. I hope you can see the screen. Can you see the screen? Can you see the skeletons moving? If nobody's saying anything, I take it that it is. So this is someone running in three conditions. Professor, Ram, running. you are seeing your first slide, not the video. Are you not seeing the skeletons? No, we are seeing right. the first slide. Maybe you can- I need to reshare the skeleton then. Yes. Uh, let me do that then. So Dr. Tyagrajan, can you allow us to record this completely? Stop sharing and I want to share now. You can reshare, please. This screen. Now, can you see the skeletons? Yes, yes. All right. So when, when you get to running, there are different styles of running. And Lieberman talked about it in his article in 2010 that was published in Nature which I strongly believe in what he said, and we really liaise with them and in Harvard University to, see, to, to explain to the BBC when, when they approach us why there is an importance in the style of running. It is not related to footwear as per se or manufacturers because manufacturers would like you to think that their running shoe is better for running, is provide you energy and it provide you uh, protection and so forth. In my opinion, these are gimmicks to a certain extent. It's actually the style of running that's important and why. By looking at these videos and the skeletons of running using gate analysis, you can see that there are ground reaction forces being generated as we are approaching the ground. So if I move it to this position here, we have, and I will increase the screen so you could see what happens at the point of landing. So this is, heel to toe landing, the one in, on the right hand side, the one in the middle is mid foot strike, and the one on the left hand side is four foot strike. All in these three conditions, 
the actual runner was wearing running shoes. If you look at the ground reaction force that has been generated in the three styles here, you can see that the actual line of action is different. What does this mean for a runner? If you take it from a biomechanics point of view and simple engineering and mechanics, you have a force that is being generated that is going through the ankle and the knee joints. If you think about moment arms, the moment around the ankle here is zero because the distance from the force to the ankle joint is pretty minimal. The moment around the knee is zero for the same reason. The same thing if you look at the midfoot landing, the moment around the ankle and the knee is zero. So the actual landing position is not helping the joint in any form or shape. On the contrary, is causing an impact through the joint and a force through the musculoskeletal system that is not being absorbed by the normal shock absorbers of muscle tendons or structure. However, if you look at the third option, which is related to the forefoot landing, what you can see that the actual force is anterior to the ankle, posterior to the knee. What does that tell us? It tells us that the landing position is causing a dorsiflector moment around the ankle, to accelerate the movement and allow the athlete to spend less time with the, on the ground with the foot. And at the same time, this is helping the knee to flex quicker. So when you're actually analyzing the forces and the speed between the three conditions for the same runner, there is a significant difference, statistical significant difference, better and more advantageous to run barefoot, sorry, to run on the ball of the foot and this is the same condition that happens when we run bare feet. So the running of style is important. So when you're dealing with your athlete, take them into their own environment and think, what is happening with them? What can I do to actually prevent any kind of injury for their own activity itself? And it differ from one sport to another. In running might be four foot landing better, in a different sport, as we will see later on, it's the opposite. You cannot generalize. You need to understand what is the biomechanics of the activity and how could the foot and ankle support the activity to minimize any kind of injury. So I'm gonna stop sharing this screen and I'm gonna go back to the presentation itself again. So, if I take, a very famous runner in, in Oscar Pistorius, and you focus on him here. So when you're looking about the Paralympics, why is he so different? And why is he faster than all the other runners? Is he better physically? Is he more trained or better trained than the others? Do the others suffer from a different disability? He's a mile almost ahead of all other runners. Why? There is a complex biomechanics involved in all these. But the simple element of it is all related to his posture. Let's look here. If I stop the video of him standing, getting ready to run, what would you be able to see instantly? If you imagine his blade as feet, how is he standing? This is the disadvantage of a webinar because I cannot interact with the audience as I normally wish. So I'll have to speak of what you could see on your behalf. Looking at o Oscar with his standing position, he's actually standing 
on the ball of his foot if he had feet there. So he's always being standing on the ball of the feet ready to run. So his body is accustomed to the normal position of how we're supposed to be running and landing on the ball of the foot. So you couldn't say that he, these blades were designed specifically for him. I think it was by mistake by the uh, developers because the same company developed the blades for his arch driver and they didn't give him the same blades. So by coincidence, analyzing the videos and analyzing how he has trained, that given Oscar the advantage above all from a physicality in order to win a race. And you could see it, he's walking on the ball of the foot, ready to run on the ball of the foot. So the force is all gonna be generated in his, on his, for him as, as an advantage to flex the knees faster in comparison to Ranieri, his arch rival. And you can see from the blades here and Oliveira that his blades were giving him a landing of mid stance. You can see that shape there. The shape is not ball of the foot like Oscar is completely the mid stance. So the actual shock will go through the knee joint through the musculoskeletal system. The other disability, if you haven't noticed it, if you don't focus on Oscar, you just focus on the other runners, that double disability they're facing from, some of them have unilateral amputation. And you can actually see them that they're actually struggling between the sound limb and the prosthetic limb. And this is something that shouldn't happen in an Olympic competition. The disability should be matched. Either you have both arms or you have one arm or no arms. Either you have bilateral lower limb amputation or you have unilateral. You shouldn't mix and match. Oscar has all the advantages to be able to be a winner. And that what made him win. He is with this shape, the best biomechanical device you can ever come across to explain how important biomechanics in a setup. And the most important thing is that what he's done during his training processes. So training is so important. If we move on and look what he does with his coach, look at the synchronous and movement between their feet. Amazing. Training played an important role. He had the blades designed rightly. Everything worked for him. So everything should be perfect to have the winning style, the winning course, as well as the right biomechanics to avoid any injuries. Considering time is against us, I'm just gonna go to one more example. And this is to let you know why you need to look at it from a perspective of the activity itself. Let's take curling. And there are two styles of curling, the Scottish style and the Canadian style. Some will go for toe sliding and some will go for foot sliding. Now, which one is better? In running, we said toe is better. Is it the same in curling? So this is the style of foot, complete foot sliding and this is a toe sliding. If we look at it, and based on our running style, we should say that forefoot sliding will be better for the athletes. However, the biomechanics tell us otherwise. The biomechanics tell us if you come on a flat foot sliding, you have no moment around the knee to actually tip you forward. If you come on a forefoot sliding, you have a huge moment around the knee that is gonna tip you forward and that's what has been causing the major injuries within the Canadian team when they're doing the toe sliding. So in this case, it is not right just to think in absolute sense 
of what we learn from one sport and apply for every other sport. You have to take each one separately and apply the knowledge of the biomechanics and the equipment that you have in order to achieve the ultimate desire of winning with no injury. And that's the important thing that we need to do to educate our coaches and athletes in order to avoid any kind of injury. I think I've overstepped my time of half an hour. Otherwise, I would have shared with you a similar experience related to uh, cricket, which is a national game in India. Uh, but that probably will be for another day. Uh, thank you for listening and please stay safe. Well, thank you, Professor Rami, for the wonderful presentation. And uh, may we request you to stop sharing the screen so the questions can be projected. Thank you. So we have, in fact, a lot of questions uh, on the YouTube channel. Probably for the want of time, we may project just one sample question. That's uh, from uh, Dr. Alison Chung from Malaysia about how do you treat recalcitrant plantar fasciitis? And part two of the question is, does the orthotic or a custom-made footwear help? It's a large topic, actually. Well, I, I haven't spoken about plantar fasciitis, so why am I being asked about plantar fasciitis? Um, look, plantar fasciitis, if you actually leave it for a good period of eight to 10 months, it will resolve itself. From my experience, from the study that I've conducted on plantar fasciitis uh, 10, 15 years ago, I found a culprit in the whole equation, which was the trigger to cause plantar fasciitis, and it was footwear itself. So it's important that you check the kind of footwear your patient or athlete is using before you attempt anything. And most of the time, with all the patients that I have treated with plantar fasciitis, the change of footwear to the right footwear supported with a, a heel insert has resolved the symptoms. But if they go back to the wrong type of footwear, it will flare up again. And this is a major problem. And the inserts, the heel inserts, play a really crucial role. And the one thing I would try to advise you is not to go for the most expensive ones. The price has no role here. It's the conformity of the insert with your foot and the patient's foot. And it would differ from one to the other. And from the study that we conducted and we published, we actually found that the cheapest insert at eight pounds a pair was better, lasted longer, than the most expensive one by Bauer at 32 pounds. Do not consider price as a guide, it isn't. And these things can be easily resolved with the simplest way, the right footwear and the right support, no expense included. Excellent answer. So it carries a lot of message. So we have an interesting uh, habit of uh, launching a poll after each talk with a very burning debatable questions. So I'm going to just launch a poll here. So those who are there online can vote for it. Here goes the question. Again, it's a burning topic. Barefoot running or short running? Better, no, depends on the runner. So I request everyone to poll their opinions and we'll have 10 seconds more. But well, there is an important thing here. Barefoot running depends on the environment and the medium as well. You cannot run barefoot running on tarmac or on concrete. That defeats the purpose. You need to have the right environment. That seems to be the answer from most of the people. We'll wait for a few more seconds before we publish the result, actually. Yes, more than 70% of the people have answered. So let's go for the results. So the results are, yes, as Professor Rami said, it depends not only on the runner, also on the conditions. So we cannot generalize these things. Absolutely Thank not. <laughs> Thanks, Professor Rami, for your wonderful uh, talk and your time. And we appreciate your time in this difficult time. So.
people. Thank you so much. We'll be in touch with you. Thank you very much. Please stay safe, all of you, wherever you are around the world. Sir, uh, sir I, have a, I have a question for Professor Rami, sir. Sir, uh, maybe after the end of the session, we'll request him to come because Dr. John is waiting. So unfortunately, we ran out of the time. So we'll have to go with uh, Dr. John now. So probably if time permits, uh, Professor Rami will come back and join us. Thank you, sir. Sure. Thank you. And uh, welcome, Dr. John, uh, to introduce Dr. Jonathan uh, from Bournemouth University. He's a very, very uh, uh, interesting person who actually uh, does a lot of research in the field of uh, physiotherapy and biomechanics together. John is a currently principal academic and deputy head at the Department of Rehab and Sports Science at the Bournemouth University in UK. So after his BSc honors in physio, he has done a master of manipulative therapy from Curtin University in Australia, and then a doctor of philosophy in the University of Roehampton, London. And Dr. John, without further ado, I'd like to hand over the stage to you. Great, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just... Um see whether I can uh, get my screen shared correctly. <clears throat> um, just uh, need to um, move this one second, sorry. <clears throat> okay, great. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, well, for inviting me and uh, for all of you guys to, to, to you guys and girls to be here to, uh, to, to listen. Um, uh, I currently am at Bournemouth University, but uh, I have uh, I've done a number of this, uh, some of this work all around them um, in some of these other areas that you see on this opening slide. So, um, <clears throat> just an acknowledgement to those other areas. I feel very privileged uh, having a look at the lineup. Um, I, I'm sort of nestled in between um, some of uh, some of my biomechanical heroes. So uh, I'm very humbled to uh, very humbled to be here to, to today to present some of my work. Let's get stuck in there. Most of us here are very familiar with the, the traditional uh, models of, of motion capture, the, the sort of gold standard being the optoelectronic motion capture systems. And uh, even I've dabbled into to that sphere. But we're also very acutely aware, I'm sure, that um, <clears throat> some of these systems have, uh, have um, you know, inherent, uh, inherent limitations uh, and some challenges, particularly environmental challenges for some of the uh, motion capture related to sport. Um, and in light of that, some uh, more novel, more uh, innovative ways of, of, of creating on-field measurement device uh, uh, methodologies has, has come out of, uh, of the literature uh, uh, historically and also uh, more recently. A, a quick uh, poll of, uh, of, of PubMed, you know, uh, shows that um, in 2012 we saw 105 papers on, on inertial measurement units. And that's increased more than tenfold over the last uh, eight years. And um, <clears throat> I have to say that I've been party to, uh, to, to, to using those and the rest of our talk will focus on those. Um, for those of you who are not quite so familiar, um, forgive me if you are, but uh, most I'm used uh, a, a combination sensor of uh, triaxial accelerometers, triaxial rate gyroscopes and uh, triaxial magnetometers. Um, each with their own individual measurement capacities, so accelerometers measuring linear acceleration, gyroscopes, rate of turn, etc. Um, <clears throat> and we, uh, we see many applications where we would use some of these individual sensors uh, for, for specific uh, measurement requirements. But um, on the whole, most of the time we see uh, that, that the sensors will give us a, an output associated with um, a, a drift-free uh, absolute orientation. And it's in Euler angles and other, <clears throat> and other measurement angles. Uh, often that's how we would apply these devices to, to the measurement of, of, of motion uh, biomechanics in, in, in the field. And I want to now just give you a little whistle stop tour of some of the applications that we've, we've um, been able to, to, to do uh, and just to, um, to, to give you a demonstration of the capacity of some of these things. So Balance, uh, uh, I was fortunate enough to work with a, with a company we developed uh, uh, what we termed as a balance sensor, uh, a small device that we, um, we would stick to, uh, to the human somewhere around the, um, the, the S2 uh, spinous process, somewhere around the center of mass of the, the human body around the pelvis and use the device to give us a, a representation of postural sway through the measurement of the anterior, posterior and medial lateral linear accelerations. 
We, uh, we wrote into the device to automatically correct for the tilt of the device at every time point, uh, and then looked at whether or not we could use some, some, some device in, uh, in a real simple clinical applications. Um, is it reliable? Um, does the human have a level of consistency to the performance that would make it usable in the, in the clinic? And really we covered a range of balanced tasks from the very simple two-legged standing for, for those you know, very low level balance applications, elderly fallers, for example, um, all the way through to single leg stance, size closed, a very common balance assessment in the clinic. Um, <clears throat> the beauty of uh, something similar, simple like this is you know, pitch side, a player takes a knock, a head knock, and you want to assess the effects of that head, uh, minor head injury on, on their balance to determine part and parcel of a concussion assessment, for example. You'd have a great capacity to be able to do that anywhere. Um, we wanted to see whether we could measure something a little bit more complex. Uh, and so we looked at the, uh, the quantification of hop landing. So this point here denotes the point where the individual has landed from their hop. We took a one second period and looked at the sway behavior of that one second period to quantify hop landing beyond the sort of traditional, which is do they land and fall over or do they land and stick the landing is the, is the terminology we use. And obviously there's a great range in between those. And we were able to demonstrate that this is a, a pretty reliable measure um, in, in multiple directions of hop landing. One other application we've, we've, we've worked on is that we, we, we uh, have developed a wobble board, uh, hollowed out the, uh, the dome, inserted some uh, uh, basically electronic tilt sensor, communicated that through Bluetooth to our computer software in order to quantify wobble board performance. Um, so in real time, we get a representation of the tilt angle of the wobble board. And also we can use it as a rehabilitation device to drive a, a, a ball around a maze provides uh, uh, individuals with a report based on the percentage of time they spend in different tilt bandings, also on the edge and number of edge contacts. Um, and again, we were able to show that that was uh, um, a pretty reliable, pretty consistent um, human performance across a range of tasks. Um, even though when you watch somebody doing a wobble board task, it, it looks just highly random and highly sporadic, but, um, but actually it's actually quite consistent. Um, Let's get into to sport. I guess that's why most of you are here and have a look at some of our applications in sport. Well, we, we, we looked at the quantification of, um, of, of, of surface firmness. Uh, I, I choose cricket because I think we might have some people that enjoy cricket on, on, on the conference at the moment. Basically, we took, a, we took a weight, stuck an accelerometer on the top and, uh, and dropped it onto a series of surfaces to measure the, uh, the deceleration profiles associated with those surfaces. Very cheap very cost effective, but um, very easy way of, of quantifying the, 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 the properties of various surfaces. Here's wood, for example, compared to AstroTurf, grass and, and rubber. Not limited to cricket. It's been done in um, some of our other applications in, in um, you know, crime scene investigation, for example. And we, take the same, we took the same sort of concept, applied the accelerometer to the, to the tibia, um, and looked at whether or not we could detect uh, the, the sort of tibial impact going through when we did some uh, running. Could we detect across different footwear, including, uh, including barefoot footwear? And uh, very interesting to hear the, the, the talk before, but we certainly found that um, you know, just because the shoe was classified as a, a high cushioning shoe or a low cushioning shoe, that was almost irrelevant. As soon as the human put the shoe on, that interaction between the human and the shoe was, was quite specific and quite individual. But again, such a, a method, such a device, very simple to set up um, out in, uh, in a clinic using a treadmill without any difficulty, not, not, not requiring a, uh, a defined laboratory space, for example. Also could be applied to track running. Um, let's get more into cricket. Um, so uh, we, we did some work looking at um, uh, attaching some uh, IMUs to the spine, uh, attaching the same sort of accelerometer rig to the to the tip to the tibia, and use this to ask some questions around cricket. I'm just going to focus on something um, hot off the press, or or I should say hot in press, uh, not quite published yet, but accepted in the in the in the BMJ Open Sport and Exercise Medicine Journal. We conducted um, a, a prospective and retrospective investigation 
um, of cricket fast bowlers. We, we took um, um, adolescent and adult fast bowlers and we were specifically interested in pain. A lot of work's been done on cricket fast bowling and, and, and lumbar spine injury, you know, fracture, for example, but much less in the sphere of, of, of pain. And we wanted to focus in on, uh, in on pain. Just a couple of snapshots in terms of our findings. The retrospective uh, um, analysis demonstrated that um, those individuals that, that had uh, no history of lower back pain um, actually used the thoracic spine an awful lot more in, uh, in the wind-up, so right rotation for the right-handed bowler um, in the thoracic spine, um, quite considerably more than those individuals that, that, um, that, that reported a history of lower back pain, essentially potentially um, uh, shifting that motion sharing further up to, uh, to the thoracic region may, may indeed be pr protective of, of, uh, of, of low back pain. That needs to be looked into in further detail, but that's the kind of thing that was suggested at, um, at the back foot impact. The other thing uh, we found, well, another interesting thing at prospective, when we looked at the prospective, so we measured their bowling um, kinematics and impacts and then followed them up across the season. Those individuals that went on to develop um, back pain they used much less right side bending in the windup. So this is right-handed bowlers. So this bending away from the wicket as a precursor to the left side bending that we know is, is used to generate a, a whip and a series of, of pace in, in fast bowlers. Those that didn't get back pain, they had a great deal more right side bending in that windup phase. Um, and we think probably that that enables them to use a lot of left side bending, but not going into a lot of left side bending range in order to achieve the same pace for their fast bowling. We saw uh, something interesting in lumbar extension. Um, this isn't a great surprise, I don't think, to those people involved in cricket. Um, but the quantification of it, nonetheless, is that those individuals that went on to develop lower back pain had a great deal more lumbar extension at back foot impact compared to those that those that didn't. I'm going to switch uh, uh, sports, talk very briefly about our application in rugby. Um, one of the challenges is, is we, we wanted to measure rugby scrummaging. Um, and uh, that's a very difficult uh, environment to put a series of optoelectronic uh, optoelectronic motion capture system. You just lose line of sight very, very quickly. So we um, we, we, we built a series of, uh, of IMUs that are connected to a CPU that wirelessly communicates out um, and, uh, and instrumented the hooker and then looked at um, the spinal kinematics during a series of machine and live scrummaging. Some really interesting results, significant uh, ranges of motion demonstrated in, in the hooker. Remember, that's the person that's head is, is most tightly bound into the scrum, still able to achieve a lot of range of motion. We, we went on and asked a series of questions ab about rugby, you know, rugby um, uh, scrummaging binding sequences and whether that affects the spinal kinematics and, um, and, and the surface and whether that affects the spinal kinematics. Um, one of the more fortuitous things that we found uh, or that we were able to observe is, um, is, is collapse scrums. Now, um, any ethics panel is going to have a very uh, raised eyebrow if you ask to do a series of collapse scrummage experiments. You know, those are the scrums that, that potentially have the capacity to result in significant life changing injuries, um, but do happen all the time when you do live scrummaging. Um, here's just one example. Here's the hooker maintaining, this is their cervical spine, by the way, maintaining a, a neutral midline cervical spine up until this point here, up until 75% of the way through the scrummaging. Then we see this starting to, uh, we see this idea of, of starting to side bend, starting to flex, and then ultimately result in a significant amount of flexion. So we see this deviation from the midline in, in, this, in, this, um, in the side bending plane, that then seems to trigger this flexion or seems to trigger the inability to maintain this neutral position such that we ultimately end up with quite deviated spine at the point of spine collapse. Just a coincidental finding, I just thought that would be interesting to share with you guys. But I'm uh, here also to ask uh, uh, for collaboration and for some assistance. IMUs are, are, are great, but they, they have a significant limitations. One of those that um, poses an ongoing challenge to, to, to me and my cerebral grey matter is, um, is, is the challenge of, of, of mounting, of orientating the sensor repeatedly in, a, in an identical orientation on the human. 
and just a slight deviation, five or 10 degrees of, of, of tilt in a, in, a, in a different plane to the plane that you are measuring results in significant um, measurement of motion that isn't essentially there. Uh, and um, this is a significant problem. It's no drama if you've got the sensor attached and through the whole experiment, the sensor remains attached. But if you take a sensor off and a week later, you wanna put the sensor back on, um, then without that orientation being the same, you, you, you're, you're prone to some issues. Now, I, I've, I, you know, I've got in my, um, you know, in my locker, uh, I think probably a dozen mathematical solutions to these problems, um, but they're all, none of them are quite right they all still have their own inherent limitations and so um you know it'd be great to uh, to, to to work on, on on this with somebody so that we can really take these into a um, uh, much stronger rehabilitation sphere where we have greater confidence with taking them on and putting them back on again um great i think that's probably uh the the, the time that i had a lot to I just want to, you know, obviously acknowledge that, that my group of graduate students have been working on these projects with me and also thank you guys very much for, uh, for, for listening. Thank you, John, for the fantastic presentation. So as uh, for the norm, let's see what questions we have for you. So here we go. So the wearable technology is raving about, people are raving about it. So how good do we think it's uh, good in monitoring sports performance? <clears throat> Joy, sure, interesting question. I, I, I guess it comes back to um, uh, what, what, uh, what element of sports performance you want to measure. Uh, and if that relates to um, something simple and straightforward, like, uh, you know, linear acceleration, then then they are the device to measure it. <laughs> you know, there, there's no maths involved in that. But, um, you know, if, if, we, if we're looking at trying to, um, to, to measure uh, uh, kinetics, for example, then there's a whole stage of, 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 of mathematical, mathematical computations that are required that, you know, that, that, are, that are perfectly fine. Um, but each time you add in some uh, elements of error that you take through, you know, so there's a whole series of, of, of modeling related issues that come with that. So the answer is, of course, it, it depends. It depends exactly on what you're, what you're trying to measure. For some of them, they're absolutely fantastic. They get you out of a laboratory and give you opportunities to measure things in different environments. However, understanding their limitations is absolutely essential for there to be any meaning put into any of the data that you generate from them. Okay, great. Thank you, John. And the second question was whether the motion capture is equal in outdoors also. Sorry, say that again. Equal in the motion capture technology with uh, 3D capture systems. Yeah. Uh, generally, it's done in indoors. So how good is this technology when it comes to outdoors? How good is, mo is uh, optoelectronic outdoors? Uh, I mean, optoelectronic is, is really good outdoors. The, the problem is you, you, of course, you know, there are always going to be scenarios where it's just not going to perform well. Um, you, you need, a, 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 in my opinion, you need a, a fairly small capture frame outdoors for uh, the accuracy to be high. Uh, you also need to have line of sight. I mean, you, you know, without line of sight, it becomes really problematic. And so um, there, there are plenty of, uh, of individuals that don't want to be... Um, uh, uh, topless when they are uh, carrying out, you know, whatever it might be, fast bowling, etc. Um, and there, there are also plenty of individuals that, um, uh, that or plenty of uh, sporting scenarios where you, you just cannot get line of sight in there. You know, the rugby scrummaging is one of those. Uh, and so you're, you're forever dealing with missing markers uh, affecting the, you know, the validity and, and the accuracy of the data that you're getting out. Uh, what I, I don't want to give the message that, um, that I am user set to replace the optoelectronic camera systems. That's absolutely not uh, what I'm saying. There, there are, 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 are scenarios where um, both of these two devices come into their own. Um, you know, take the optoelectronic systems, for example, you're getting your, your location and your orientation um, for, for marker clusters. You, you don't get that with the IMUs. You have to computationally create a location. Uh, and that is problematic. And so again, you know, it comes down to the, to the specifics. How important is it that you're in a laboratory, how important is it that you're outside of a laboratory? 
you guys have a fantastic uh, cricket setup in your laboratory, an enormous run up. There's no compromise at all from that perspective. Um, most clubs don't have that. Most universities also don't have that option. And so we have to come up with ways in which we can um, overcome that. Um, so again, you know, it just depends on, on the application you're trying to. Thank you. Thank you. In, in fact, the poll question for your session happens to be on the same topic. Let me project the poll. Here it goes. The validity of the results of the biomechanical analysis are better when it's done indoor compared to outdoors. Sorry, better in outdoor compared to indoors. So should we do it on outdoors is the question. So again, people can answer. I think the question has been answered. So we'll wait for a few more responses before publishing the poll results. Yeah, I think most people have agreed upon one point and we have an unanimous answer almost. Yes, I'm ending the poll now and here are the results. It depends on, again, sport. We cannot uh, generalize these things. Anyway, lovely. Uh, thanks, John, for your uh, wonderful speech and your time and sticking to the time so that uh, other speakers can have uh, their talk also. Thanks, John. We'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then it's my pleasure to welcome to the webinar another great name in sports biomechanics, Dr. Mark Portis. Uh, who actually needs a probably no introduction to most of us here. is an icon in the cricket uh, biomechanics research. He was the head of sports uh, science at uh, uh, sport movement science in uh, Australian Institute of Sports and has its own uh, now firm now. He's a founder manager of Praxis and he does consultancy. And uh, he, we all know, is a game changer when it comes to sports biomechanics. And without further ado, may I request uh, Mark to share his screen and start his talk. Thank you. Mark, you have to unmute yourself, Mark. Sorry about that. Sorry. <laughs> it happens. Okay. Can, could you please start uh, again? Yeah, I'll start again. Thank you very much for the very generous introduction, uh, Dr. Cat. Um, uh, yes, very generous. I don't feel uh, <clears throat> I live up to that. But anyway, I will move on. Um, and uh, thank you to the previous two speakers. Um, excellent talks, which I... Um, I learned a fair bit from both. Um, I'm taking, uh, it's interesting, I'll, I'll um, cross over some areas where um, the... Um, get the message to start my video. Do I need to start my video? Okay. Gotcha. Sorry. Okay, so um, I will I will cross over. There's a couple of interesting areas where I, I cross over with um, what the previous speakers were saying. And there we go. I'm going to look at um, a, a two technologies. So a um, the theme of my topic really is just uh, the impact of technology, and I'm looking at a couple of technologies that. Um, have already made an impact on biomechanics and we've seen a bit of that already with the previous two talks. Um, uh, but also going to talk a little bit about, I think, the potential of these technologies for biomechanics and research uh, and why, why they're important. So more of a conceptual talk, I suppose. Um, so the, uh, the one on the left, um, as you look at the screen, immersive environments, and then the one on the right, the wearables. And um, Jonathan just gave an excellent talk on um, his use of IMUs and his research. Um, so firstly, and I really just want to talk about the concept of sports ex expertise. And that came up a bit too in um, 
Professor Rami's talk. Now I need to bring this up and I'm going to have to reshare, I believe. Um, okay. So, did you see that video okay there? Luis Suarez scoring his back heeled goal. Um, and really I'm displaying that. Uh, just let me get my screen up. <clears throat> I'm really displaying that just to show um, the concept of expertise um, and that it's, it's a very dynamic and um, interrelated concept. So um, biomechanics doesn't necessarily address everything to do with, with sporting expertise. And I'm fearing most of us here in the audience um, involved with sports science and sports medicine um, probably deal with um, athletes that are trying to get better, trying to be the best athlete they can be. Um, and it's probably worth just stepping back and looking, well, what actually in the research so far, and this is my potted summary of my understanding of the expertise literature, and I'm, and I'm, I'm not an expert in expertise, but I've um, got quite a few colleagues who are, and so they've been teaching me over the years. Um, but experts in sport, usually it's, it, um, it's not specific. I mean, sorry, it is specific to that sport. It's not transferable. Um, um, so if you're if you're an expert in a certain sport, say it's cricket or tennis or swimming, um, you're usually not an expert in another sport. Now there are a few a few exceptions where people are very talented in, in more than one sport. Um, interestingly enough, a lot of high quality uh, athletes at the top of their game, the top of their sport, did play a a large variety of sports in their development. Um, I also uh, were lucky enough to have um, uh, family support. So that's been a research, uh, a research theme with expertise coming out uh, where family support has been a big factor in their journey um, from being a young athlete right through to being senior athletes. And that's little things like um, you know, good nutrition, um, good emotional support, good psychological support. Uh, the practical things like getting people to training and practice into the game, um, you know, getting up at four o'clock in the morning, get the swimmer to the pool. Um, that, that, that's been a characteristic of a lot of elite, elite athletes in their, in their history. Um, they tend to understand their sport better as well. So they actually understand the demands better than uh, non-elites. They understand the nuances. Um, and you only have to listen to some of these experts on the commentary these days um, with sport and cricket's a good one, um, where you'll hear the um, you know past players, recent past players talking about all the nuances of sport and it's um, of the sport and it's quite amazing. Uh, their training history usually has something different about it, and it's um, um, a dedicated. There's usually dedicated, clear, purposeful practice that's that's featured and part of their their training. They just didn't go to training and go through the motions. Uh, ability to self-regulate. So they take control and um, they take responsibility. Um, the ability to um, make good decisions and um, take ownership for uh, parts of their life that they can control has been a feature in the sort of the psychological domain. They can adapt better to new challenges and new situations and that can be within game, um, but also to life's general demands as well. Um, they perceive critical information better. So um, especially in the dynamic interceptive sports such as baseball or um, cricket batting or baseball batting, uh, the better players <laughs> pick up cues out from their opposition um, earlier and they understand what they mean better. Uh, and then from that, and they sort of work in sequence together, they make better decisions. So uh, the, better, the better cricket batter, um, sees cues and the bowlers 
uh, action, sees cues and the ball is flight as leaves the hand earlier than lesser players, lesser, lesser skilled players. And then they have an ability to move well. And we've seen, um, <clears throat> seen some research already demonstrating the talks about the concept of moving well. Um, but all these things are very highly interrelated. And my point is, I suppose, you're going back to that Suarez goal. That is a highly um, unconventional, unconventional goal. So, you know, measuring that and trying to train that from biomechanics perspective doesn't necessarily um, allow you to fully understand that, that form of expertise that Suarez showed. And it's that interaction of all these factors I'm talking about here. Um, but with these new technologies, we can, we can study more and more and understand more of the interrelationships of all these factors and how they impact on the biomechanics and how the, the biomechanics impacts on them. Um, so if you look at uh, the immersive environments that get used in various industries, um, obviously flight simulators are well known. Um, you're actually recreating the atmosphere. Um, you can recreate the forces, you can re recreate the, um, the stress. Um, so it's, it's it's more um, you're looking at the fidelity of the actual skill and you actually rep replicate the skill. Um, so there's been strides forward in this um, and these by no means um, uh, finished products. I don't think that there's a long way to go in the evolution of these types of products. And this is an example of a pro batter system uh, for cricket and baseball. So it's using, um, using video to simulate um, uh, the pitcher and the cricket bowler uh, respectively and there's actually quite a sophisticated ball machine behind the screen there that projects the ball out and can simulate an out swinger or an in swinger a short ball a full ball it's an example of a curve ball or a slider in baseball um, and that can be married to the video playing on the screens and now there's there's a multiple um, different products similar to this on the market these days um, similarly the golf simulator um, you see these around and uh, this is this is working the other way where the actual um, the projectile is going into the screen and then, then the, and the, um, the flight of the projectile is being simulated. <clears throat> uh, and then fitness industry, obviously here's a cycling, simu cy cycling simulator uh, where can, the demands can change the screen and so it just makes it more immersive, um, gives more um, it's more of a psychological enhancement to the to the um, to the practice of the skill and to executing your skill. And in this context, in the fitness industry, obviously that provides um, more more incentive, um, more stimulation to keep going with your fitness, and you can build challenges in. <clears throat> uh, and then the um, military and the gate side of things is probably. Uh, one, one area where I'll lead into, and this is one of these technologies I'll talk a little bit more about in detail. Um, a few years ago, I was, I was lucky enough to go and visit the Walter Reed um, Army Medical Center in Washington in the States. And um, they had this, uh, this immersive uh, virtual reality environment with the treadmill and, uh, and the big screen. And um, it's the Motec Karen system, which is, um, which is what they had. Now I've just got a quick little video to show you. Okay. Just, okay, just stand by. Light switch. Okay. I think that should be working now. So this is the Motec Karen system. Um, this is at an institution in, in America. So this, this video is just on YouTube. Um, but if you can, I want you to look at the, um, so there's someone walking on, on here on this treadmill. So it's a full motion treadmill. So it's got six degrees of freedom. So it can, um, it can rotate, tilt and, tilt and sway. And it's coupled to what's been shown on the on the um, on the screen, so um, I thought this was a good example because you can what you can actually see that the treadmill move um, in in synchrony with uh, what's been played on the video, and you'll also note they've got this um, participant also um, uh, having to fulfil a, a cognitive task with those two uh, those two balls there. They're actually um, uh, 
recreations of the markers on his wrist. Um, and so he's got to try and hit birds. So they're actually giving you some cognitive load to um, actually test how his skill and how he can map the, um, the different terrain, how he can um, navigate the terrain being cognitively loaded. So I'll just play a bit of this for you. Okay, so you see here as he comes to the little hill, the treadmill goes up and he goes down, sways. Missed the bird, so there's a bird flying through it. He's supposed to try and hit that bird as it's flying through, he goes up. Here comes the bird, bang, you got it. You got points for that, but he's still got to navigate all this rough terrain going up and down. Okay, so at the same time as this, this system's got some, uh, I think it's got a Vicon system, an optoelectronic system um, operating. And um, so it can uh, make all the sophisticated measurements that you've seen in the previous two speakers um, uh, talk, and, you know, all the kin kinematics and the kinetics, um, look at joint moments, etc. Uh, along with the cognitive load. And so that's that's the big point of my talk here, um, is that uh, I think technologies in the future of biomechanics is actually trying to broaden the scope and look at the look at the skill from a more holistic perspective. Um, and these technologies can definitely help do that. All right. Okay, should be back on my slides. Let me know if we're not on the slides. You can't see my slides, but it should be back on the slides now. Uh, all right, so that's the, uh, the MoTeC Karen system. Um, and so that, and that comes in a variety of, of forms and I'm not, uh, I'm not trying to flog the, these technologies to you, but just to give you an, an example of what's out there. Um, and if you've got a million or two dollars, you can buy one of these um, these systems yourself. I reckon they'd look really good in Chennai, actually, at the Centre for Sports Science in there. Um, so they usually have a six degrees of freedom motion platform, and a dual belt instrumented treadmill, so you can get force, the forces, um, 3D motion capture, high speed video, virtual reality screen, or if you go for the top top of the range model, you get the cave. Uh, and then surround sound. So just to make just the um, the fidelity of what they're trying to recreate um, is uh, just going to another level. So this concept of what we we're just talking about in the previous talk and Jonathan's talk about you know IMUs and you can measure out in the field uh, versus laboratory equipment, camera systems outside versus inside. Um, there's this there's I suppose there's this continuum of how realistic do you need do you need the action and the skill to be. To measure the biomechanics and get the true real biomechanics of what's happening and what technology do you need uh, so in the future i can see this sort of this um, sort of technology um, making a big impact in biomechanics um, in sport um, obviously it's doing it in gait at the moment um, but I, I can see sport specific contexts and scenarios um, when I was at the Australian Institute of Sport, we were looking at this technology in terms of, you know, what sports could we use it for, what can we replicate it for, what, where's the competitive advantage, um, you know, we're starting to think about things like, you know, can you, can you replicate key competitors, say, in a, in a 100 metre race, can you actually replicate a true biomechanical model of your key competitor and, and replicate that within a studio type environment that sort of sounds real, smells real, feels real. Um, and then you can train and try different strategies and tactics and work on your own biomechanics against your key competitor. Um, so that improving performance and safety and rehabilitation. But I think, you know, to get to, get to that stage, it's probably a while off yet. But um, some nice straight strides have been made. Uh, the second area was uh, the wearables area. And this has come up again. And um, obviously we're seeing um, a big use, big um, spike in use of um, wearable technologies and, and you know the GPS driven technologies um, more from a physiological side at this stage in team sports um, you know I think most professional um, elite teams around the world are, are, are either using this te technology or um, wanting to use this technology um, and as Jonathan um, nicely outlined the different components of, of the inertial measurement units, which some of these commercial devices 
combined GPS with um, you know, the gyroscopes, accelerometers and magnetometers. And um, I think in time, when smart blokes like Jonathan do get um, the mathematics um, all sorted and nutted out uh, behind it, um, you'll see a big impact in this. And the, and the amount of data that these systems pump out already is phenomenal, as you can see from this chart below. Um, I'm, uh, I'm doing some work with um, Rugby League here in Australia at the moment. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of data that gets pumped out. And that's another challenge in itself, probably the subject of another talk, is how you use the data, when you use it in the data. Um, and it's quite different in a research environment from um, working in that elite sport environment where you've got um, pressure, you've got to turn things around quickly. Um, and sometimes there's a lot of data that's not getting used. So um, in terms of um, in terms of this expertise concept that I'm throwing at you folks is, um, and I think this market, this um, wearable technology will be able to help again, understand more about um, uh, the biomechanics and the skill of expertise um, more than just probably what we've done historically. So, you know, a lot of it's been around about move well in biomechanics. Um, so what I'm, what I'm trying to suggest is I think with these technologies, you're probably going to get more of that. You're going to study more of that. Um, so the perception, the challenges, the environment um, is, is the advantages that these wearable technologies uh, definitely provide. Um, and the other thing I think is we'll, get, we'll, we'll start understanding um, variability better and movement variability has been talked about quite a lot in the last decade or two um, in the sports biomechanics literature and, and sports biomechanists have been criticised for um, originally not not embracing the concept of variability and movement variability enough um, and some criticisms I think some have been a bit unfair to be honest but um, we're leveled at the sports biomechanics industry that it was um, was set on there was one ideal movement pattern. Um, so, you know, there's one way to shoot a free, free throw in um, basketball. There's one way to hit a cricket ball. There's one way to dive in the swimming pool. And I don't, it's a bit, to be honest, I don't know of any biomechanist that's ever proposed that. But anyway, that was some of the criticism. Uh, I, think, I think the reason why biomechanics um, didn't uh, assess variability is because the load to actually um, analyze trials using older technology um, was hard work. It would take you a long time just to analyse one trial, let alone trying to analyse hundreds. Um, so some key, uh, some key uh, points about variability, movement variability and expertise we know is that this concept of functional variability um, versus is there, is there one consistent pattern that, that, that elite performers um, execute. Um, and to know that you need to measure lots of trials and this is where this, uh, the, the, the wearable technology um, will definitely help. Will definitely help because we'll be able to do it in different contexts um, and be able to do, do it in different environments um, and don't have the limitations of the lab. Now I'm not saying throw out the lab, the lab's still important, the lab can still do um, uh, some very important things for sport and athletes but it just depends on, you need to understand context um, and uh, what you're really trying to achieve, what you're really trying to understand. Um, so for example, in the, in the free throw, just to give you, an, to uh, try and bring it to life a bit, what I'm trying to say here. So in, in biomechanics research, um, looking at people perform um, the free throw, uh, experts, expert performers seem to be quite consistent with what they do around the kin kin kinematics of um, the wrist and the hand. Uh, but they seem to have more variability around about what they do with the elbow. Um, and so, and this has happened in a few other sports as well, where so what's really critical to execute the movement uh, seems to be a fair bit of consistency in that with experts, but then um, other points further down or up the kinetic chain, kinematic chain, um, seem to show a lot more variability. So that, So experts seem to have multiple ways um, to get that end point uh, um, executing the skill properly. So you think of another example, think of the cricket fast bowler. We've heard about that a few times tonight. Um, 
you know, you think of uh, Jasper Bumbra, you'd have to say he's pretty much heading to expert status these days, excellent fast bowler. Um, and he's got quite an unusual technique, but he's probably got a fair bit of variability around um, aspects of his technique and the biomechanics of his bowling. But he's probably pretty consistent about how he releases the ball and where the ball is coming out of his hand. Um, but he's got variable different ways of um, organising his body to do it. And, that he, and an expert needs to do that because the pitch might be different. There might be a foothold in the, in the pitch. Um, the correct, that means he needs to adapt his game and, and adaptability is a big part of uh, that expertise we were just talking about in their skill. Um, and this is probably my last slide. Uh, and you think about um, biomechanics research moving forward. I mean, historically, this would have been <coughs> what uh, an eight over spell and fast bowling used to do back in my early days. Um, you get a bowler to bowl 48 balls. And this is just bogus data I've generated, but typically, let's say this is um, this is trunk rotation. These are trunk rotation numbers, and um, you know, my honours my honours uh, research looks look remarkably like this. Um, each each red circle there reflects um, the trial that was selected for analysis, um, and that was mainly because there was just no more time to do it. Um, the research had to get done in a year and there's so many other things to do and it took a lot of time to analyse the full body um, from multiple views um, to get the data out and processed and analysed. Um, whereas these days, um, with the capacities in, in microtechnology in these wearable units, all of those trials really is ex in expectation now you'd analyse all those trials and um, research projects going forward. And just have a look at what that might actually do to your results as well. Um, you can see there's a fair bit of variability in those results. Um, all for all trials, the mean standard deviation there is 31 plus or minus 8. Uh, with the selected trials, the mean standard deviation is 40 plus 6, plus or minus 6. So, um, you know, that can actually change results and I think will drive a deeper understanding of um, skill performance as we move forward. Uh, and the other part is environment, and you've or you guys have already talked a fair bit about that. So, in that middle picture there, you've got the um, you know your standard-looking smallish biomechanics laboratory. Um, you know how realistic is that laboratory uh, to the context, to the skill, uh, and where the skill actually uh, typically gets evaluated. Um, so, if the skill's being compromised, and you're doing your biomechanics in that laboratory. Um, you're probably not getting a true representation, a true task representation of the skill. Um, things like humidity, um, cold temperatures, hot temperatures, um, and in a country like India, where uh, it can be hot, and I've been told that the Indian thermometer, there's only three measures in the Indian thermometer, hot, hotter, and hottest. Um, you know, they're all, they're all actually important environments, uh, important environmental conditions um, that need to be considered in, in terms of skill execution and expertise and the biomechanics thereof. Uh, you think about fatigue um, in those different environments um, and, you know, the role of extreme cold, the Australian kangaroo there in the bottom left in the snow. Um, you know, are things different for that kangaroo? The biomechanics of that kangaroo are actually different because of that snow and, um, might, might well be. All right, I think that ends me. I hope that uh, that little journey into a conceptual different world might have might have been helpful to some of you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark, for the lovely talk, ending with the very valid point of our three constant climates, hot, hotter and hottest. <laughs> okay, now we may go to some of the questions that have come from the YouTube uh, live stream. Yeah, as we anticipated, a lot of questions on the biomechanic equipment, especially the optoelectronics being expensive and out of reach for many teams and countries, especially in developing countries. And do you have any suggestions for, or alternatives for coaches who can do it on the field easily? A question from one Rosli Amero. Um. Yeah, 
common a common challenge, and I'm sure many countries don't have a million dollars to invest in a um, in a Karen instrumented treadmill system with a virtual reality setup. But uh, look, some of the some of the wearable technology is um, reasonably affordable. Um, but yes, you do need the expertise for it. So it's a matter of um, either finding you, you, need, you either need to get some training or get an expert in. Um, and of course, you know, good good coaching. Um, you can't beat good coaching. Um, science and technologies. Uh, you know, I'm in the business, so it's um, I think it's valuable. And it's important, and but it's it's a tool. Um, but I think uh, you know, for good coaches. Um, more than the majority of being a good coach is about understanding sport and having a good relationship with your athletes. So um, if you get those things right, you'll be, you'll be a long way there. I've seen plenty of coaches that have all the bills and whistles but have rubbish athlete, rubbish, rubbish relationships with their coaches, uh, with their athletes, um, and uh, all the bells and whistles and the best science in the world won't do anything. So don't fret about having the big budget. Um, you know, systematically look at ways how you can get better and how you can slowly introduce technology. And I think, you know, a slow burn um, is the way to go, especially with a limited budget. Okay, that's uh, encouraging to hear, uh, Mark. And uh, the second question is uh, from a student. He's asking, are we training really the central nervous system using the virtual reality and other immersive technologies that you have shown? And thereby, we are improving the biomechanics of an athlete. So he probably wants a little bit more of how this VR and immersive new technologies they are. Yes. Um, I suppose in terms of if I talk about it from skill, a skill perspective, you know, a lot of a lot of um, skilled athletes and ex ex experts, um, their their skill, their ability to to execute their skill and um, demonstrate their prowess is uh, largely automated um, but they can see and so um, the way they move they don't need to be thinking about the way they move and the way they execute their movements um, they're more thinking about what's around them what opportunities are available uh, what are the constraints i've got to um, navigate so um, you know being in a biomechanics laboratory and trying to bowl a ball at um, at the stumps or at a, at a target. Um, if you set it up well, yes, it's it's relatively valid, but um, it still doesn't match the intensity of um, being in the match, being hot, being uh, being being hot and humid, um, having the crowd screaming at you, having a batsman at the other end who may be smashing you around the park. Um, so I think I think things will change. That things will change. So really, it's about. Um, yes, the role of the nervous system, the role of the, cognitive, uh, the role of cognitive load, and how experts can manage the cognitive load better um, than than lesser skilled athletes do. So that's a big part of it. Thanks, Mark. And uh, we have a whole question for your session. Having talked about the criticisms that the biomechanics receive, uh, there is a question like. Is there a, have been a real efficient transfer of knowledge from the lab to the field? Has it happened already or it's not happened? And people have started polling. As we all know, people have been criticizing us for uh, biomechanics for uh, not testing in the real conditions. And now this question is about whether the real knowledge from the lab has reached into the practical application, into the field. So we have had a 50% of people have voted. Let's wait for a few more seconds. Some people are still thinking hard, I guess. Okay, we have five seconds more before we release the results. Okay, here we go. Let me share the results with all of us. Yeah, it's very encouraging to know that uh, People feel that some amount at least has been knowledge has been transferred from the field, sorry, from the lab to the field. So thanks for the responders and uh, thanks, Mark, for your time and uh, wonderful talk. We'll be in touch with you from on the behalf of IASM and uh, on behalf of MASM. We thank you very much. So that brings us to the next speaker.
of whom I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. R. Nadrajan. He's a great athlete from uh, our own part of the uh, world. Dr. Nadrajan is a retired athlete now, but he has done the country proud with lots of achievements, uh, getting a lot of awards on the way. And uh, he has academically also excelled brilliantly with having securing a Doctor of Philosophy award. And uh, he is an eminent coach himself, recognized by the International Athletic Federations. And uh, without further ado, let me introduce and uh, welcome Dr. Natrajan to our uh, webinar to share his thoughts about uh, biomechanics in athletics. Sir. Good evening, Dr. Thyagarajan. And uh, good evening, all my friends here on this webinar, coaches, professors, and it was a nice webinar. And uh, the professor Rami presented a wonderful lecture on foot analysis, how, how biomechanics can be very useful on placement of foot. And of course, uh, Jonathan Williams spoke about balancing of and how biomechanics can help your body. And it was very nice uh, of Mark Portis, doctor, who from Australia have come uh, on the webinar to explain how to prevent injury by biomechanics. Let me share my screen. So first of all, why we need biomechanics? That's a big question. If given a chance in 100 meters in your lane, you will be, a, you want to run straight or you want to uh, slide like a snake, zigzag running. Or if you're climbing the stairs, if you're climbing the stairs, you want to climb stair right up straight or you want to go in a zigzag way? So uh, the answer Dr. is easy. Uh, can you please uh, present in the full screen mode? It is in yeah. a slight sort of view now. Yeah, can you hear me? Can you see it now? Yes, yes, yes. So given the chance uh, to run 100 meters, you will run like a snake in a zigzag way or a straight way or you will climb the staircase in a, um, a zigzag way or in a straight way. The answer is very simple. Anybody, logically, they will say, yes, you, you walk straight, you walk, climb straight, you run straight. Why? So the simple biomechanics, why? That is what in athletics. So you have uh, to correct your technique. Biomechanics is essential to correct your te technique. And above all, to find faults in your technique. Biomechanics helps you. And it also has very rightly said by Professor Marcus. He said that uh, to prevent injury, biomechanic helps because by proper apply application of biomechanics, you can avoid injuries. And above all, he added to that for effective movement of performance, your assessment of muscle is done and analysis of sports equipment also can be done. So these four parameters, your anatomical fa factors, your neuromuscular skills, your physiological parameters and your psychological and cognitive abilities plays a major role in your performance. For these biomechanical effects, aspects, application can help you more to better your performance. So let me tell you about uh, the law of mechanics involved in the human body because it is involved the Newton's first law, the Newton's second law and the Newton third law. So the, how these laws involved in the action of the human body is in the biomechanics. In other words, to say how these forces create the motion inside the body and the, the physics and the mechanics of the motion, how it creates the, uh, the forces inside the body. And of course, these forces are into two categories, the internal force and the external force. The internal force are the forces which is generated inside your body. Because I'm going to talk about athletics where biomechanics plays a major role. Let me tell you the basics of biomechanics involved in athletics for a short while. The internal forces are nothing but the forces generated by your muscles and your joints. So these are all your internal forces. And the external forces are your gravity and your friction. The gravity is the, boy, is the weight forces you down to the ground and the friction is the force which breaks you and stops you further movement. The action is stopped. So these are the two external forces which acts on the body. 
the application of these the interaction between the performer and the equipment or the other bodies in which comes into contact whether it may be a track or it may be an equipment in a javelin throw or a hammer throw or a shot put so what is the interaction between the performer and the force acting on the implement and the last but not the least what are the external forces which acts on the body which can affect the body forces and which will result in your uh, performance for example a 200 meter runner so when he takes the curve there are two kinds of forces uh, one is the centripetal force another one is the centrifugal force the centripetal force which directs the body towards the center the force acting on the body which is going on a rotatory motion goes directs into the center portion so that is centripetal and the force which directs the body outside the center is called centrifugal so these two forces acts on the 200 meters runner when he executes a curve the centrifugal force will take him away from the track so he has to balance the body the external force and bring the body inside so that he executes the curves and goes into the straight so these are the two forces let me tell you about uh, uh, the latest science in biomechanics is divided into two parts one is the kinematics another one is the kinetics in kinematics we study about the geometry of the moving objects the angle of your ankle the angle of your knee joint the angle of your hip joint the angle of your shoulder joint the angle of your body posture i'm sorry so the geometry of the body the moving objects you study in this and application of kinematics plays a major role in displacement in velocity in acceleration and the angle of joints so all this study implicates implements the kinematics then comes your kinetics what is kinetics kinetics is nothing but the relationship between the internal force and the external force as i said the centrifugal force the centripetal force the internal force which is developed from your body and the external force is developed from outside the body which has an impact on your performance and last the changes that is produced by the producing the body motion so when the body moves in a run or a jump or a throw so the motion is produced the force is produced so during that time there are a lot of changes happening in the body so the study of this is called kinetics kinetics is nothing but movement so put together kinetics and kinematics is biomechanics so let me also introduce some terminology what is a force it is simply a pull or a push how force is me measured or the for simple formula is mass into acceleration f is equal to ma so your mass into acceleration is your fo force and what are the types of motion we have linear motion rotational motion and general motion so it is applied in athletics every each and every motion is applied in athletics in different events and velocity is nothing but how fast in which direction how fast the object moves and in a particular direction that is called as velocity what is acceleration the increase in velocity is called acceleration and deceleration is decreasing in velocity and of course momentum is nothing but your weight into velocity how your body weight transfers in a particular time so that is your momentum so you gain momentum once the force is generated from inside a body and it is your transferred the force into the implement or to the external performance and the angular momentum is nothing but your moment of inertia and your rotational your rotational velocity when it combines together your angular momentum takes place because all these terminologies are used in athletics so when we go for event wise you will come to know what is i'm going to explain to you event wise in athletics as such we have running we have jumping and we have throwing so we are going to see what are these terminologies and how this biomechanics works well and see how it is in the foot placement as very well explained by professor rami so while walking what happens you see you can see this uh, pendulum you can see this pendulum uh, uh, the heel goes first while walking and comes on the toes and while jogging heel comes and then goes moves with the spring action the spring action slightly increases in the running in a for a middle distance or a long distance or a marathon runner so what happen you place your foot in the middle of the foot in the arch of the foot and then you roll the ball of the toe in running but whereas in sprinting 
your foot placement is completely on the ball of the foot because i had a, i had asked a question to professor rami whether for a sprinter for being a sprinter for a successful sprinter how does biomechanics help in placement of the first touchdown of every step either the the foot has to be on the outside or the foot has to be placed on the center of the ball of the foot so he replied immediately very beautifully i totally agree with that the foot has to be placed on the ball of the foot for exact sprinting action because like a pyramid the body balance completely lies on the center of the ball of the foot so if the if while in the plantar flexion when the when the body is tilted to the outside automatically your inward uh, there is a prob there is a all probability of inward injuries so to avoid that injury it is better to place the foot on the center of the ball of the foot so that is about the sprinting action so let me talk about uh, the forces in the athletics the centripetal force uh, we have discussed about centripetal and centrifugal force and uh, of course there is a force called breaking force breaking force is nothing but the forces the accumulation of force in your body in from inside a body how fast how far and how stronger you can break that force for example uh, how the you break the velocity of the force generated inside your body that is called breaking force we are going to see how this breaking force is very useful in athletics especially in each and every event like sprinting jumping and throwing then comes this vah nice wonderful formula so vah is nothing but uh, v is nothing but the velocity of the take off while jumping and a is angle of the angle during the the degree of angle during the take off in a jump or in a throw and height is nothing but in a jump the height of the your center of gravity when at the time of take off that is the height so this vah plays a major role in the performance of your jump as well as throwing events so coming back to what is center of mass what is center of gravity is one and the same the center of mass is nothing but your uh, body weight which is balanced which is evenly distributed it is it is an imaginary point where your body weight is evenly distributed so that is center of mass or center of gravity so what happens how many of us know that 9% of energy is used for your overcoming the resistance of forces acting externally while running a middle distance or a long distance whereas for a sprinter they consume 20% of energy to overcome this external forces to overcome the resistance of external forces so to break down this percentage and to minimize this percentage this biomechanics will help you so let us start about in sprinting so the, the newton's third law says that very clearly every action has got an equal and opposite reaction so when you uh, sprint when here you can see the toe is touched down the more the pressure you give downwards the action equally the amount of same force is bounced back that is reaction so the action and reaction takes place simultaneously based on your newton's third law and when you are in the starting block when you push the block here if you can see this pushing the block here is action and releasing from the block is reaction so how fast how far and how stronger you push the block is the matter then comes in your hurdling in hurdling your action and your reaction of the leg then comes your long jump see the action comes when you're when you're bringing your arms forcing it downwards and then taking it backwards then the legs comes forward that is the action reaction in long jump of course the breaking force as uh, said i earlier the forces how fast you can break the forces and the velocity how well you can break the velocity of the running action especially in running and sprinting the touchdown has to be minimized if you hold the leg for longer period of time in the ground the support phase in the support phase that is your breaking force will be more so that breaking force has to be minimized so the touchdown has to be very soft and very faster so react faster so that you go to the next stride so the speed is maximum so the touchdown has to be minimized so the breaking force in sprinting has to be minimized in hurdles steeple chase hop step and jump triple jump all these events your breaking forces has to be minimized and of course the center of mass in the sprinter for in the sprinting activity your center of mass as i said earlier it is nothing but the imaginary point around the body weight which is evenly distributed so the center of mass is always higher 
if for a stronger sprinter if the center of mass is higher than your um, uh, above your hip level then your speed is at maximum it is positive sprinting it is positive center of mass and the ballistic arc will be much higher so the sprint will not decelerate you will keep on accelerating so this is where the center of mass plays a major role in sprinting that is why your hip has to be straight and your upper body has to be upright so that the center mass is always lift, lifted above your hip level and then keeps your body straight in posture for sprinting action then comes your running you can see carl lewis and usain bolt see their high knee lift see their torso their torso is fixed and the shoulder is arm swing is fantastic and their neck is your neck head is fixed properly and see the toe dorsiflexion so the dorsiflexion is uh, the, the dorsiflexion is very important and because it can fasten the uh, touch down and minimize the breaking forces while sprinting see as i said earlier see the touch down here the first is the support place uh, the foot has to be touched very fast and then bring it and brought it back to the heel butt kick so that is where the breaking force happens it has to be minimized so that the drive phase comes faster then then comes the support phase then comes the drive phase so the breaking force has to be minimized let us have a look at a small video of how uh, hussein bolt uh, running action is being explained by the former world record holder michael johnson see see is some action i would like to explain here you want this coming in very tight if you look at that picture over there wow you see that. so here the action is instead of swinging the leg at the back instead of swinging the leg at the back i am going to pass the picture here this is michael johnson here the 200 meters former world record holder uh can you see the can you see the leg can you see the leg here and see his leg here it is extended here but here it is shortened so that the the uh, drive phase is much faster and he gets a gains a speed and the touchdown is also much uh, faster it is minimized and coming on to the uh, drive phase the heel but the heel should not touch the butt but at the same time it should come faster and to get the support phase and do move on to the drive phase see his torso is moving very clearly very fixed and very relaxed upper body relaxed his face and uh, the arms closer to the arms closer to the body not going away and that is how the drive phase goes up and another picture i would like to show here is about hussein bolt uh, the running action and uh, see his if you see his knee knee is criss crossing because biomechanically it is analyzed hussein bolt's knee is asymmetrical because the left knee and the right knee is not symmetrical so the biomechanical aspects of the hussein bolt knee which is helpful in his running action so that uh, to balance that he is having a wobbling action in the torso and balances the body and in spite of that he is coming out of the blocks very faster and gets on to the drive phase so if we can narrow down his uh, uh, minimize the asymmetry of the legs then uh, his speed will be much faster can you see the uh, knee action coming inside criss crossing the other leg so that will be a very big disadvantage biomechanically definitely if he had corrected that uh, he could have run much faster can you see the knee now crossing up crossing up the other knee so which has uh, a uh, which has an imbalance and the force will act against his running straight action so there is a uh, centrifugal force which takes the body out that is why he has a wobbling action in the torso so this analysis is very important for any athlete to have a correct uh, perfect running action so let us move on to the long jump long jump the same action of uh, the three concept v a h velocity of the takeoff and the angle of takeoff and the height of the takeoff at the time of takeoff 
So this is uh, the world record holder in long jump, Mike Powell, 8.95 meters, where the three point, there is a common point in biomechanical action of all the uh, four jumps, your long jump, triple jump, pole vault, and high jump. So the three point is that your ankle joint, your knee joint, and your hip joint, at the time of takeoff, should be in same line, in one line, complete one line. So if that extension is there, automatically, uh, the performance will be much farther and better. So we have to insist biomechanically as part, as part of the coach's eye, the coach to uh, identify whether these three joints extend completely while taking off. Automatically, you will have a correction on the biomechanical action. So the in long jump, it is the conversion of horizontal velocity to vertical velocity. In triple jump also, the horizontal velocity to vertical velocity, but in triple jump, you have to maintain the horizontal velocity in each and every hop and step and jump. So that you have, a, because in long jump and triple jump, you have to go in the approach run has to be an optimal speed. Then comes your high jump, where your horizontal velocity plays a very minor role. Because in the J-shape running of Fosbury flop, while taking up, when you take the twist, the vertical, before the vertical velocity, the horizontal velocity converts into the vertical velocity. So the centrifugal force, you have to take the advantage of the centrifugal force by blocking the takeoff leg and, mini, and maximizing the uh, braking force so that the takeoff is maximum, twisting the hip and the center of mass will be below the hip level so that you go to maximum higher and the takeoff is fantastic. And whereas in pole vault, uh, three velocities are converting. The approach run is the horizontal velocity. It is when you plant and then you take off, it is vertical velocity. Then comes your rotational velocity where your kinetic energy, the energy produced in your body has to be transferred to the pole. That is the potential energy where it is kinetic energy is transferred into the potential energy while jumping over the pole vault. Here the center of mass, let us have a look at the center of mass. The center of mass in high jump, when you clear the bar in the Fosbury style, the center of mass is below your hip, behind your hip. Whereas in the pole vault, it is in front of your stomach. So when you're vaulting it, the ball clearance, the center of mass comes behind the, uh, inside your stomach. So you, this is Sergi Bukwa, the former world record holder in pole vault. You can see uh, the stages of pole vault, how he takes off planting and with the still position and then ro uh, uh, rocking back and then takes the twist turn with the horizontal rotational velocity with the vertical velocity converted to the rotational velocity and clears the bar. And uh, the performance limiting factors in all the jumps is the takeoff. The takeoff is, there are many performance limiting factors, your environment, your climate, everything matters, your track, your track suit, your competition, everything matters above all your main jumps take off your limited contact time the speed strength and your maximum strength plays a major role and when you're transferring the velocity for example the horizontal velocity to the very vertical velocity your speed strength and maximum strength matters a lot so the coaches have to make a point here you have to train for speed strength and maximum strength to limit the contact time while taking off for transferring of the velocity coaches please understand you need to develop speed speed strength and maximum strength. So this is a small technical uh, training hint uh, secret where the coaches have to develop, uh, develop these aspects for better performance because this is how the biomechanical aspect can help you in athletic performance. And what is summation of forces? Summation of forces, the summation of force is nothing but, summation of force is nothing but the uh, force developed in every joint and all together in one sequence, the full force comes to in one point and executes it, transfers into the implement and the performance comes using every joint in one order. If you see in the first, it is too early. Legs, hip, shoulder, hip, wrist. Whereas it is timed here when you use the force from the legs from and from the legs to the hips, from the legs to the hips, from the hips to the shoulder, from the shoulder to the elbow and from there to the wrist. Then while throwing the shot put or the uh, discus throw, then you will get the complete force so that the maximum performance is obtained. So this is summation of forces. So as I said earlier, the velocity, angle and height matters a lot, the parabolic path. So when you, took, when you throw a uh, hammer throw or a, I mean shot put or a discus throw, the velocity, the speed at which the implement is released, 
or the force is generated from the body the kinetic energy is transferred to the potential energy the velocity is generated and when it comes to the height the angle and the height matters so that the uh, shot or shot or the discus travels a longer distance so vah matters uh, uh, plays a very vital role impact on the uh, performance of throwers see here is uh, here is the uh, example for the shot putter you can see his uh, left leg blocking the uh, shot put uh, uh, blocker where the leg is blocked the braking force is maximized here you have to whereas in sprinting the braking force is minimized whereas here the braking force has to be maximized why because to transfer the force from your kinetic energy from your body to the implement your potential energy so you have to break that force and transfer the force to the implement so that is why the braking force is maximized here in all the throws so if you take the uh, javelin throw for example see this leg the left leg is blocking the force the 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 breaking force is maximized here this is neeraj chopra our indian record holder and asian gold medalist in javelin throw so this is a perfect action in javelin throw and uh, because your biomechanical action the technical as action plays a major role in your performance and when it comes to the discus the world record holder michael farting richard farting from west germany so here recently he won the gold in the rio olympics and he is going to block his uh, discus throw left leg uh, before throwing the discus so that the maximum performance comes back so the breaking force is maximized in all the throws at the blocking action for a delivery phase here especially in javelin discus shot put and hammer throw you can see this here so the 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 throwing events the javelin throw the leg is blocked here like this the discus throw leg is blocked here and the uh, hammer throw i mean i mean the shot put the blocking is done here so fantastic it is so this is a basic of biomechanics involved in athletics about running jumping and uh, um uh, throwing because mainly the main factors are uh, as i said the center of mass the vah velocity uh angle and the height of the release then you then comes your braking force then comes your or all your action and reaction newton's third law and of course last but not the least your center of mass so which plays a major role in your performance in athletics thank you so much for your for this wonderful opportunity i thank the indian association of sports medicine and the sri ramachandra institutions for giving me this great opportunity especially i appreciate the malos the malaysian association of sports medicine who has come in hand to support this webinar and make it a grand success thank you so much thank you dr nadrajan there was a very wonderful lecture covering basics as well as advanced facts as well as practical facts so it was all compressed into one for uh, addressing all the audiences today including the students here and the experts and uh, as usual we have a lot of questions in fact but due to the time constraint we have put only a few questions which i'll just share the screen now so the main questions are uh, seem to be one from ashwati rajendran our student who's uh, also a sprinter uh, athletes with uh, some injury causing them to have deviations in running biomechanics due to pain or injury or asymmetry sir how uh, would you advise advise them to bring back to their original running form i would like to know what kind of injury they had because come before coming into action they have to rehabilitate and recover from the injury and then come back for training and when you start training ensure that you get rid of the fear of the injury you had because usually athletes will have the fear of injury though the injury is fully recovered you have a psychological aspect thinking that still your hamstring pain is there your calf pain is there or your back pain is there you have a pain you have an intuition like that so try to avoid that and then recover fully and then come into the technical action and slowly build up your techniques with your speed excellent sir so this is what as uh, sports science uh, people we expected this answer and uh, you have completely given the correct answer and Thank you. Uh, the second uh, question is uh, from again another student i'll just share the screen again uh, she is uh, he is ashish so he would like to know what are the optimal levels of 
hip flexion during the knee drive and the extension during swing phase you have mentioned in your slides is there any particular number that they have to look at yeah as a, uh, maybe i think he is asking with the relative to sprinting where well, in relative to sprinting you have four different phases once from the explosive start you have the drive phase from from the drive phase in the drive phase what you have to do your hip is has is uh, kept as low as possible to the ground because you are taking off from the blocks it is almost parallel to the ground and your knee and your shin has to be very parallel very close to the ground so it is almost it is uh, almost 20 degrees or 30 degrees the best sprinters have gone up to 30 35 degrees maximum and usain bolt with the height of 6.5 feet he has gone up to 30 degrees to 35 degrees in the starting block which is matching the best 6 uh, uh, feet runner so from the drive phase when you come to the acceleration phase where you gain maximum velocity before before maximum velocity your body goes upright and your shin bone and your knee bone bone is also upright your hip has to be perfectly on the center and the because that only maintains your upper posture perfectly uh, fixed if your hip is a uh, hunch if you have a hunch back the upper torso will also lean forward which will lead to your total collapse of your running action so your deviation view of your arm action and your center of mass will go down so in the during the acceleration phase and when you come on to the uh, maximum velocity phase you have to lift your hip upright your bolt upright i, I should say so that your center of mass is always kept above your hip level excellent sir excellent and uh, as usual we have a controversial question as a poll so let me try to project the poll and see how everybody reacts with the answer so here is the question running whether it's 100 meters or marathon seems to be dependent on genetics largely is it a strong factor are you saying strongly yes or seems so or third option is not at all other factors are more important than genetics so a lot of people have started answering whether it's genetic predominantly no other factors are predominantly or in between Rajan sir, what is your opinion about all this genetic testing and all these things? Meanwhile, people can start uh, continue polling. Hundred percent, hundred percent. It is proved and it is documented and it is evident that sprinters are born; they are not made. So there is a gene called ACN3, actin and three. So that gene is responsible for sprinting. So let's see what the public they say now. I'll share the results. Ah, uh, it's a very close. fight between uh, strongest and other factors also and uh, yeah people have been uh, equally giving their opinions of course we have a variety of uh, audience in this so they have given so thank you very much sir uh, it's a pride for us to have you in the webinar a real sprinter and a sporting hero as a speaker also here and we thank you very much for your participation thank so, you thank you so much for the honor and privilege sir pleasure so with this we come to a close and uh, to we we'll wind up things uh, we have a representative i think from malaysian association of sports medicine professor mahin can you do the honors of proposing the word of thanks please thank you sir thank you i i really honored uh, to be here and uh, is a very interesting topic and uh, even though i'm not in the uh, biomechanic but i would say that uh, it was a very interesting insight especially from the uh, uh, professor uh you know, i can recall his name at the moment but yeah. he started very well on the flat what they call on the food and explained about it and john have put it very well and uh, dr uh, nadraj uh, put it very uh, practical session and and uh, putting it in a very how to say uh, uh, layman la language but to understand the perspective of the biomechanics there's a very important perspective there i would like to thank every each on uh, the panelists and also the viewers there uh, excellent uh, presentation prof rami i i really admire i i i'm a person who don't even understand about the biomechanics but i learn a lot of things from you and uh, you have shown me the video and i i guess a lot of people learn about it from there and i thank uh on behalf of the malaysian association of sport medicine to uh indian association of sport medicine for bringing this kind of uh, speakers we really thank you prof and uh, all 
goes to Prof. Tiaga and uh, Prof. Arumugam. Thank you very much. And the Faculty of Sports Science and Recreation also appreciate the effort of these two uh, body institution. Very, very thank you to all of you. And a happy weekend to all of you. And those who are Muslim, uh, those who are celebrating Raya Haji or the Hajj uh, festival, my best wishes to all of you as well. Tomorrow, we're gonna to have another session on sports psychology. We welcome all of you as well. I think Prof, uh, Dr. Nataraja have mentioned about it. Uh, you must get over your fear. Uh, this is where the fear comes inside. So I, I, I believe all these things are working very well. Uh, how it is going to work, and we're going to see in tomorrow's talk, they're going to talk about the musics, they're going to talk about the futuristic yoga, and they're going to talk about the uh, COVID, how we're going to be uh, uh, cognitive effects, and also the psychology effects in netball players. I think all of it, this is all linking up the biomechanic, the biopsychology, and the exercise science that we finished and sport nutrition. I think with that, I thank you all of you very much and uh, excellent presentation. Thank you very much, sir. I'm back to you, sir. Thank you, Prof. Mahin, and thank you all speakers on behalf of uh, our president, uh, Prof. Armugam IASM, and on behalf of MASM. Let's all uh, get together tomorrow again for the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Very good presentation. Thank you so much, all of you. Mahendra yeah. Apakuti, thank you so much. Yes, sir. I've met you in the Coimbatore once for the uh, Avinashalingam.